Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracy's The Populist Dialogues. Our program promotes progressive, populist perspectives on the issues of the day. The Alliance for Democracy is dedicated to establishing true democracy and ending corporate personhood. Our guest today is Suzanne Gordon. Suzanne is an award-winning journalist and author or co-author of 21 books. Her writings have also appeared in the New York Times, the LA Times, the Atlantic, and the, and the Nation, among others. Today we're going to talk about her latest book, The Battle for Veterans Healthcare, Dispatches from the Front Lines of Policymaking and Patient Care. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, yeah, David. Yeah. So how did you um, just, well, no, let's, let's not start. Start with a description of the VA because I think, judging from what you've right. written in the book, what I had thought about the VA was very wrong, and I, it's much larger, right. number one. So the, veter the Department of Veterans Affairs is, um, the VA, is <clears throat> made up of, th it's the second largest agency in the federal government, and it's made up of three branches, three agencies. The Veterans, Sem the National Cemeteries, the Veterans Benefits Administration, which has to do with distributing benefits like the GI Bill, home loan, health care, et cetera, and the Veterans Health Administration, which is the largest agency in the Department of Veterans Affairs. The Veterans Health Administration is the largest health care system in our country. Hmm. It's probably the only it is the only fully integrated, publicly funded healthcare system in our country. It's one of the, it's it's a large, one of the largest healthcare systems in the world, um, but not the largest by far. Mm -hmm. um, and it's essentially socialized medicine, and sort of not pure single payer for for veterans. Um, the, so when people are talking today about VA privatization, they're not talking about the cemeteries, although they could get to that. But they're talking about the Veterans uh, Health Administration, mostly about um, slowly but surely outsourcing more and more veteran care to private sector physicians with the government paying and having very little oversight. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and there's some outsourcing going on in the Veterans Benefit Administration. And essentially, um, it's also important for people to understand that of the 20 plus million veterans in America, not all of them are eligible for VA care because Congress in its wisdom has said, and I say that sarcastically, has said <laughs> that not all the people who serve our nation are eligible for VA care, although we could certainly, uh, VHA care, although we could certainly afford um, to provide it. Um, only people who have service-connected disabilities some problem that was acquired or exacerbated by military service and or low income. So there's these eight priority groups, eligibility groups, and, and um, it makes it very cumbersome to administer. So a lot of times when veterans complain about the VA, you have to ask them, are they complaining about the VHA, the Health Administration, or are they complaining about the VBA? Because the VBA is chronically underfunded and understaffed, and since they have to go through all these cumbersome procedures to prove eligibility, which um. we could go on and on about, um, you know, that can take a lot of time. And often they're complaining about the VBA, and people are thinking they're complaining about the VHA. Oh. And really, what they're complaining about, but they they don't know about is Congress because Congress makes these rules. Okay, okay. L l let's go back to the eligibility. One, I think, large group of people, uh, veterans who are not eligible, are people who have got less than honorable discharges. Right, it's on other than honorable discharges. So, what determines your eligibility is, you know, how long you served and what your discharge status is. And your discharge status is determined by the Department of Defense. And if you were in, let's say, the Marines, and you had PTSD and got drunk, 
drunk or got into a fight and they decide they want to discharge you because you're you know not up to snuff they can discharge you with an other than honorable discharge and um, that means that you will be ineligible for VHA care even though you will need it because you had PTSD or military sexual trauma or something like that and there's 500,000 people that currently have these other than honorable discharges. The president has, um, President Trump ha and, the, and, and the secretary of the VA before he was fired, Secretary Shulkin, um, issued a, 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 an order that said that all of these people with other than honorable discharge, if they're in a mental health crisis, can get 90 days of care in, in the VA. And, in, mm. and uh, But that's not enough, yeah. you know, and it's also they, they didn't add funding and staffing to that. Uh, which is a pattern you'll see with this administration, uh, which is that they add um, add obligations and and no but no funding and no mm -hmm. staff. Okay, all right, yeah. So, um, how how is the VA healthcare system different from a private healthcare system? Well, it's a system. Um, and most private, we people like myself who have excellent insurance, you know, you could go to this doctor here, that doctor there. Your insurance company may dictate which doctors you can go to, which hospitals you can use. It's not necessarily dictated by quality. It's dictated by price, you know, who gives you the best price. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the people that give you the best price are the people that have the lowest quality. Mm -hmm. um, and. Um, these prices are all secretly negotiated. We don't know really how much we pay for care, and it's almost impossible to find out except for Medicare. Um, and um, basically, most doctors in America are fee-for-service, you know, as opposed, the, although we're moving a bit away from that, but um, w everything is fee-for-service. And so there's an incentive to deliver more costly and an inappropriate and dangerous care. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of fragmented care. People don't talk to each other. The VA, a, the VHA, is an integrated system. So um, the veteran can move from Peoria to Portland and their health record will follow them, all their information will follow them, as opposed to me when I moved from Boston to San Francisco, it took me 15 months to get my providers to mm -hmm. send my record, you know. Yeah, you, um, could, be, you could be dead by then. <laughs> yeah, you know. Um, and, um, in the VHA, there's no incentive to overtreat because everybody's on salary. Oh. They have much lower costs because people are on salary. They have a very good drug formulary. They pay less prescription, met less for prescription medication, and the care is integrated. And I and what I mean by that is, let me give an example of yeah. primary care. Mm -hmm. So you or I might go to a primary care practice and we say we're having trouble taking our medication and the doctor will be very rushed and won't have time to explain it to us because they have a patient panel of maybe 3,400 patients and a 10 minute visit. In primary care in the VA, they, they'll have maybe 11 to 1,300 patients in their patient panel. They have 30 minute visits. More to the point, they will have a a, a, a psychologist or psychiatric nurse practitioner right down the hall if you have if you're complaining about mental health problems if you need to, to learn how to take your meds no worries that the doctor doesn't have time or expertise in explaining that there's a pharmacist down the hall there's a dietitian if you're having problems uh, maintaining you know proper diet there's a social worker it's all in the same place um, it's very much one-stop shopping for veterans um, in most places, obviously in rural areas that's different, but they're trying to do more telehealth in rural areas, and many veterans live in rural areas. Um, it's coordinated care in that every VA employee, for example, is educated to some extent in in basics of suicide prevention, in dealing with what we call disruptive veterans. There are many veterans who have mental health problems who are very angry and irritable and sometimes dangerous to themselves and others, and people are trained in dealing with that. In Yonville, California, we just had a veteran who killed three uh, people in a psychologist in a, uh, a private sector 
not-for-profit called Pathway Home. If people saw Thank You for Your Service, mm -hmm. that movie and that book um, was partly about Pathway Home. And uh, uh, on a very angry and mentally ill veteran shot um, uh, three clinicians, one of whom was a VA psychologist who was 32 years old and, mm -hmm. and six months pregnant. Mm -hmm. that, that program closed because of that. The VA can't, doesn't close programs because of this. It, it, it has to keep on going. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, good. Um, veteran health issues are frequently different than the general population. Um, how does the VA deal right. with that? You know, we have a move towards more and more outsourcing of care to the private sector, and I think private sector physicians and nurses and mental health providers are not prepared to deal with the very specific needs of our veteran population. Military service creates a lot of problems or exacerbates a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. Veterans have more back, neck, shoulder, knee, feet, pain because of carrying these 70 to 100 pound packs around, way more than the average um, uh, patient. A lot of pain problems. Pain problems lead to um, risk of suicide, enhanced risk of suicide. Veterans have about twice as much mental health problems. Many veterans are homeless. Um, veterans have problems with irritability and anger and adjustment to the civilian world. Um, more veterans have uh, substance abuse problems. Um, veterans have military sexual trauma, for example. About 50% of female veterans have been either sexually harassed, it's a spectrum, or maybe even yeah. raped. Mm -hmm. um, so these veterans have very toxic exposures in the military. We, agent for veterans in, in Vietnam, it was Agent Orange, the herbicide, and that creates a lot of you know problems, diabetes, prostate cancer, heart problems that the average private sector provider would not perhaps recognize, a, and if they don't recognize them, they're not going to be put on the Agent Orange Registry, they're not going to get compensation, and so forth. There's burn pit exposures for Iraq and Afghanistan veterans. There's all kinds of toxic exposures for people who've never left the United States because it's a very toxic environment, a military base. So these are problems that, that veterans have that are very specific. Um, the average Medicare beneficiary has three to five presenting problems. The average Vietnam veteran has nine to 12. Oh my, okay, yeah, okay. Uh, where is the drive to privatize the VA coming from? The drive to privatize the VA is coming from a number of different sources. One source is the conservative energy billionaires Charles and David Koch, the Koch brothers, who yeah. founded and fully funded a group called Concerned Veterans for America, which is a phony veteran service organization that is dedicated solely to killing the VA the VHA. They want to kill it, not because they're interested in veterans' health, but because Koch, the two Koch brothers hate government. And they're ideologically committed through all kinds of foundations um, that they fund to killing, to denying climate change, to killing government regulation. Um, they hate it, you know, um, because it would regulate their industries. Um, and um, they hate government. They hate government um, as a source of good. And the VHA works. The Veterans Health Administration works. Every study that has been done, and they come out consistently, shows that VHA care, in spite of its problems, is equal or superior to care in the private sector. And the Koch brothers hate that, so they want to tarnish the image of the VHA, and they've done it. They've infected the mainstream, even liberal me media, um, to tarnish the image of the VHA. Then there's the hospital industry. Uh, big hospital corporations want the money that the VHA has. It's an $80 billion plus budget, and they want to get their hands on that money. They're not particularly interested in, in serving veterans' needs, but they want the money. Then there's people like Stephen A. Cohen, the hedge fund insider trader, who um, is setting up a competing uh, 
uh, mental health network called the Cone Veterans Network. Mm -hmm. And I think that they want to compete with the VA because they're privatizers. They want every all of government money to go to be uh, directed toward towards um, private sector providers. There's a the pharmaceutical industry, the medical equipment industry. So it's a combination of, of ideological and financial interests that merge together. And they've been really successful as we are speaking. The House is ready to um, pass a bill that essentially will slowly privatize the VA. And we need to get people to call up about that because it's going to go to the Senate. And even if it passes, people should register their deep disaffection with um, these privatizing bills. Yeah, so the uh, House bill number is? The House, if the House bill is 5674 and the Senate bill is 2372. And um, it's poised to pass. And it's tragic that uh, there are um, Congress people like, like somebody like Beto O'Rourke from Texas, who really is a good guy and is probably and is going to vote for this because they've been bamboozled into believing um, that, um, that the VA people need more choice. You know, the veterans need more choice. And they don't understand that this. Uh, this choice movement is taking the VA as, away as a choice because the more money that goes into private sector health care that comes out of the VA budget, the less money there is for VA clinicians, VA programs, VA facilities. Part of this bill that's about to pass is, a, uh, is essentially like the Army base closure bill. bill. It's a VA close, facility closing bill. And it's all a setup because if you outsource more care and you and you have less people going to the VA, that justifies closing veterans' facility, you know, health facilities. It's all rigged, you know, to mm -hmm. end up in more and more outsourcing. Yeah, and it seems like uh, it's rigged in this sense that most bills, when they are introduced into Congress, never even get a hearing, uh, and this bill was just introduced into Congress what, within the past two months? And already it is set to both move to the Senate and uh, to get a vote. Well, and you know, one of the tragic things about this bill is that the veteran service organizations, groups like the Disabled American Veterans and the American Legion and so forth, that really understand that the VA needs to be strengthened have supported this bill. and they've been really put in a position of feeling like they have to do something. And um, when they really should have been stalling until the next Congress. I mean, the reason why the administration is pushing this bill so hard, it's a bill, by the way, that is supported by the Koch brothers and the Concerned Veterans for America, so that should tell you something. Mm -hmm. It gives enormous power to the secretary of the VA when we have no secretary of the VA. It gives enormous power and employment implementation to a VA that is now controlled by the Koch brothers. And um, it's really baffling to me that the Democrats and the veteran service organizations are supporting a bill which is patently going to lead to privatization, even though they say they're against privatization. And I think that this is an example of misguided good intentions, which are going to have very bad unintended consequences. We mm -hmm. saw that with the VA Accountability and Whistleblower Act, which was passed last year. It was supported by Tammy Baldwin, a Democrat, co-sponsored, supported by a lot of, of Democrats. It was supposed to help ease, make it easier to fire high-level administrative officials. We've seen now that what's happening is they're firing housekeepers and transport workers and scare uh, taking uh, due process rights away from people so that they're scared to uh, say, excuse me, doctor, you are maybe giving the wrong medication, or that, uh, that program is really not a very good idea. And um, we're seeing people leaving the VA. It, it's harder to recruit, and this Out Accountability Act is not making the VA more accountable, it's actually making it more um, less accountable, and people are terrified, mm -hmm. um, and they're not raising their voices. This is, we have to remember the VHA is a healthcare system. When you scare people about 
talking about problems, when you scare people and tell them that they can't inform themselves, that they can't um, raise their concerns, that kills people mm -hmm. because it's healthcare, mm -hmm. right? It's not like an envelope factory, you know, mm -hmm. or or a, you know, or, or silicon chips or Disney World, right. and. Um, this is going to end up, the, you know, this is going to end up killing people. Yeah. Um, veterans who are fired, who have um, mental health problems, who were who were hired under worker, wor the veterans, uh, the VA has a work compensation program, and, which is a kind of a work therapy program, compensated work therapy program. If these people are fired because they can't meet the new productivity standards, these are veterans who have mental health problems, PTSD. Some of them are going to kill themselves. Mm -hmm. And some of them will certainly end up on the street. And they'll homeless. end up on the street, homeless, because mm -hmm. they can't get another job. And people are not thinking about these unintended consequences. Yeah. And, and they're going to pass another bill that's going to have even worse consequences. Yeah. So when you say people, you're really talking and about Congress, Congress people. Congress. Because the rest of us out here in the general public have no idea that this is happening. Well, and the general public has been bamboozled by the media. Mm -hmm. which has had in the past four years almost nothing good to say about the VHA. Mm -hmm. and, and the drumbeat has been, you know, the VHA is broken, there's all these wait times, and nobody asks compared to what, yeah, yeah, you know? Right. Mm -hmm. The average wait time in the VHA is way less than in the private sector. Which, uh, yeah. The, 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 the other thing that you would comment on in, in your book is that these uh, private clinics are able to advertise and VA oh, yeah. is not. So would you well, that's, on that? The average hospital in America spends um, about a million dollars a year advertising and marketing and branding. The VA spends nothing. So what's going to happen with this uh, new Mission Act, you know, if and when it passes, is it's going to open the floodgates to more advertising on, on the, from the private sector. Please come here, veteran. We have this great program. The VA is not going to be allowed to, to spend money or isn't going to be allocated money to advertise. And so more veterans are going to, you know, go uh, to the VA. I mean, the Cone Network, um, uh, they, there's somebody who works there from the VA who basically talked to a journalist I talked to who was just trashing the VA. She had mm -hmm. left the VA and was trashing the VA to this journalist. And uh, even though the, the Cone Network is supposed to be working in partnership, so-called, with the VA, um, I think that you're going to see a lot more of that. And that's a huge waste of taxpayer dollar that we're going to be supplementing and subsidizing mm -hmm. to pull people away from the Veterans Health Care Administration. Okay, why does that matter? Why does that matter? Because the VA gives better care. Yeah. The VA gives mm -hmm. better care. And Rand Corporation, which certainly has no stake in this, just did, for example, yet another study about the superiority of VA care. And it looked at New York State, which has the fifth largest veteran population in the country. And they, they interviewed a whole range of private sector healthcare providers, and they had seven criteria through which they judged the readiness of these providers to deal with veterans. And the, of those surveyed, 2% met those criteria. Two wow. percent. What was even more astonishing was that the vast majority of, veter of these providers knew nothing about the specific health care problems of veterans, and 50% said they weren't interested in learning about them. And since these private providers are not members of integrated uh, service uh, delivery networks, if you, I, I'm right. not sure if that's the exact right phrasing, but since they're not, uh, it's highly unlikely that the veterans would get that kind of, uh, of care. These people they don't really talk to each problem, other. Not, right. Yeah, I mean, uh, let me give you a great example. I was yeah. in Milwaukee talking to a psychologist, and uh, there was a veteran, an Iraq veteran, getting a gallbladder um, <clears throat> operation. And he was on the floors, and he was freaking out because his PTSD was triggered. Uh, the surgeon ended up 
because they worked together, calling up the psychologist saying, help, help. She, you know, told him exactly what to do to calm the veteran down, went down there to calm the veteran down. He got the surgery. This is not going to happen in the private sector. I really encourage um, all the people who are listening to this show to use this phone number, 833 Four eight zero one six three seven, which is a line that you can use to call your senators and Congress people. Follow the prompts. It takes two minutes. It, it takes two minutes, you know, to call your congressman and, and maybe four minutes to call both your senators and ask them to vote against the mission, the VA mission bill. Um, if you would like more information, you could go to my website. But there's a wonderful website, the Health Veterans Health Care Action Campaign .org, um, and that has a, an analysis of these bills. Um, I think you know if you're whether you're a veteran or not. I'm not. A veteran. Nobody in my family is a veteran, but it's. I have a, a, a bumper sticker on my car that says, "I love my VA and save my VA," because it is our VA. You don't have a, to be a veteran to have paid for this uh, this healthcare system to benefit from its research and teaching, and also we owe it to the nation's veterans to to, to make sure they get high quality health care and they're not going to get it in the private sector. Right. Okay, good. Uh, would you f just give us the phone number again and the bill numbers? So the um, it's House Bill uh, 5674 and Senate Bill 2372 and it's the v VA Mission Act and the phone number is a, a line that will um, help you m do this much easier and quicker, 833-480-1637. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you so much for Thank being you. here. Thank you. Thank you for right. having me. You bet. Right. Yeah, so our guest today has been Suzanne Gordon, an author and speaker with special expertise in healthcare systems, teamwork, patient safety, and nursing. Today she spoke with us about her latest book, The Battle for Veterans Healthcare. As Suzanne has explained, HR 5674 and SB 2372 need to be opposed as an attack on the VA system itself. For those viewers here in Oregon, note that Oregon Representative Greg Walden has added himself as a co-sponsor in the Senate. Uh, that should be enough to tell us that this is not good legislation. So please call or write your U.S. representative, tell them that you oppose uh, these two bills, which is known as the Mission Bill. Note that this bill seems to be on a fast track uh, for passage, so call, uh, write those letters now. Thank you for watching our program. I hope we'll see you again next time. Bye.